Today, um, we get into a message that um, uh, I've been pondering for some time, at least since the beginning of the new year, and, and, and God's led me to, to, he's released me to share it uh, today, and, and, and so I started processing it fully uh, this week, and it's something that's critical, not only if we're going to reach people for Christ that aren't right now reached, but it's, it's critical if we're to have relationships, healthy relationships with, with one another. We must learn how to reach beyond or connect beyond our, our, our viewpoints. I mean, think about it. If, if all of our relationships depended by us all thinking exactly, exactly, exactly the same, we wouldn't have any, okay? Um, the only person that you don't have different viewpoints with is the person who you've never talked to. And, you know, if you don't, listen, if you only have, if you only have discussions that are an inch deep, um, you won't detect these things. But, but if you have a deep relationship with anybody, you instantly or soon as you are looking, maybe not through love-colored glasses, um, you, you realize that, hey, you know what, there's just some things that we have uh, that are different. Um, in fact, I've, I've never married a, um, a couple or been around a married couple that had been together for a long time that didn't have to learn how to grow and communicate with each other beyond um, our viewpoints because all of us have a natural tendency. We want everybody to see the world the way we see it and agree with what we're passionate about or how we interpret things. I want you to hear this today. No two people in the world think exactly the same, whether Christian or non-Christian, whether family. In fact, listen, family... Listen, if you ain't going to fight with your family, you ain't fighting with nobody, okay? What I used to tell my wife, is she's like, listen, um, I hope you don't treat everybody else like this. I said, babe, I can't. They leave me. <laughs> so for all of you out there who you go, man, <clears throat> I don't understand why I got to raise my husband. You and my wife can start a group, all right? But I want you to understand, in my household, just like in yours, Everybody does not feel the same way. You throw kids into that, and you got yourself a party. And so I, my kids are 24, 22, 20, and 13. And you know what? The, the almost 14-year-old, he'll be 14 mid-February. Hard to believe my wife's that old. <laughs> I say these things just to butter you up, if you want to say, because we can get real serious here in a minute. The more you throw into the mix the harder it is to, to get along, especially as, um, uh, you know, what happened to my youngest happened to the same thing happened to all three of my other kids. The older they got, the stupider I looked. The more they did not agree with one single thing that their daddy had to say. Now, I, I think, parents, one thing that can help us is to realize we did that with our parents too. It took a while. God had to give us a child that was just like us. That increased our prayer life as well as brought us down a few notches. Listen, this world has never been more confused, divided, and conflicted when it comes to different viewpoints. And I'm not just talking about whether you're Republican or you're Democrat. I'm talking about in general. We, we live in a, in a society, we can't agree on what's truth. We can't agree on what's not truth. We can't agree on what's absolutely right and absolutely wrong. Whether we like it or not, this world is full of many, many different viewpoints, not just nationalities. This world is full of more non-believers. I want you to hear this part. Write that down somewhere. This world is full of more non-believers than believers. I believe the world is at least, bare minimum, 80% non-believers. I don't base that off of anything more than the fruit that it produces based on the fruit that we see and and the things that that, that seem to be um, the norm most people do not have a Christian point of view most people listen I, this is what I tell one of my boys I said listen we cannot have a healthy healthy high level conversation when it comes to certain things if I believe absolutely that the word of God has the final say versus you're still trying to figure out whether that's the case for you 
And so I have to wait until someone has a, um, if you want to say, a, a, a common ground, a neutral uh, viewpoint that can guide us towards our truth. Listen, if we're going to work together as believers in Jesus Christ, we have, to, we have to embrace one another's viewpoints. You know why we know that Christians are divided? There are plenty of people who truly, genuinely profess Jesus Christ as a Savior and Lord, and yet there's a million different flavors of churches. Not just um, different churches, period. That's why you have different denominations, okay? Again, a different denomination doesn't mean that, that you don't, um, trust Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. But your perspective is different when it comes to your theology. For instance, let's just use the simple stuff between a, a, a Baptist and a Methodist. One of the biggest things jumps out is the Baptists believe, listen, you better go all the way deep under so we can baptize you. And another one says, listen, all we need is a light sprinkle. I wouldn't say that either one is worth fighting over, okay? What matters is are you taking that next step of obedience? to profess your faith in Jesus Christ. Listen, if we're going to come together, if we're going to try to connect with other people, we need to let the meaningless things not keep us from the meaningful things. You hear me? We, we got we to choose our battles wisely. I definitely believe that's the case when it comes to our family and our friends, but it certainly is the case, too, if we're going to reach the people who have a far different worldview than we do. Today's message is not about trying to change your viewpoint, but it's about learning how to reach others who have different viewpoints. Today, let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, God, I pray that you would guide our hearts, our minds, our attitudes, our actions, and our approach in our everyday life. God, open our eyes to see what you want us to see, open our ears to hear what you want us to hear, and open our hearts that we might receive what it is that you want us to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's look together. If you've got your worship guide with you, let's look together at this message entitled Reaching Beyond Your Viewpoint. I try my best, even though there's sometimes not a, a ranking order of things, to, to, to say, well, what's the starting point? What's, what's, the, what's the biggest motivational uh, reason to do this, and, and what's, the, what's the greatest thing that we need to do above all else? And that's this, to reach beyond your viewpoint. Number one, you need to love others like Jesus. To reach people beyond your viewpoint, you have to love them like Jesus. God gave this to me this week. The hardest people to talk with aren't just those with a different viewpoint, but those who feel you will only love them if they agree with your viewpoint. Do you know why a lot of people don't want to walk into a church? They have the perception, based off of some people's communication or just them assuming because of somebody else they ran into here or there, that if we don't agree with their viewpoint, they aren't welcome at this point. And we have to do something as a church intentionally to, to break down that barrier. Listen, showing sincere love, it is the bridge to people's hearts. Well, that's not just unchurched and lost people. That's period. People, people do not want to hear anything from me, and they don't want to hear anything from you if they don't even think that we care about them. If they, if they feel like we're just full of us instead of full of him. Listen, it was God's love that built the bridge to our hearts. John 3, 16, you all know it. For God so loved the world that, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son. Why? Because he loves us. Jesus went to the extreme measures to demonstrate his love. I want you to hear that part. God demonstrated his love to introduce you to his love. Before he led you to anything else, he, he made the first move. He stepped outside of what he had to do, and he, and he did it because he loved you. Listen, believers aren't called to agree with and join darkness, but we are called to love those in the darkness. And so oftentimes that happens outside the church doors, okay? But we also want them to feel it in here, but we want them to feel it out there. Jesus never loved the sin, but he's always loved the sinner. Romans 5, 8. I didn't put it up here on the screen, but it says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. 
Listen, no matter how much times may change and how smart we may become, God's loving flowing, God's love flowing through us will always be the most powerful thing within us. It doesn't matter what we say or do. If it's not pointing others to the love of Christ, it's just another religion. It's just another religion. It's saying, hey, I'm right, you're wrong. Jesus didn't agree with everyone, but he genuinely loved everyone. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 says, If I could speak all the languages of earth and, and of angels but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Now, God's word goes on. I'm just sharing this with you. Um, verses like 4 through 8, and, and he starts talking about what does that love look like? Well, listen to some of the things he said in there in 1 Corinthians 13. He said, love is patient and kind. It's not boastful or proud. It is not demanding of its own way. It's not irritable. It keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but it rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. It never loses faith. It's always hopeful. It endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. If you ask me what's the most attractive thing that a person can do in order for people to be attracted to Christ, it's love. Because if God's love is not flowing deeply in us, God and his agenda isn't either. Everything God does for us and wants for us, even to this day, it is driven by his love. It's like when a parent um, you know, genuinely is trying to express, express to a child, I might not agree with you, I might not like what you're doing or not doing, but that's not going to dictate my love. Everything we do in word or deed towards others must be driven by the same love that Christ has for us, and guess what? The same love that Christ has for them. Those who don't know Christ need to feel his love pumping through our veins. God wants us to walk and talk led by his love. He wants us to remain in his love so that we can remain fruitful for his kingdom. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 says, Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Listen, your words can be right and your approach and your attitude be wrong. Ask me how I know. Any of you, you had the best of intentions, but you went hillbilly deluxe pickup truck. I, I, I mean, like, it was easy for me to prepare for this, this message because I'm like, listen, Craig, think back on all the times that, that things just tore loose. You, you, you gave away pieces of your mind that you wish you could bring back. Okay. You spoke in tongues and didn't even know it, and there was nobody there to interpret other than you were crazy. That's, that's me. That's my story, at least. Everybody's different. Some of us were quick to express. Some of us are like, man, I'm not saying another word. Listen, we've got to learn how to express truth with love. We've got to learn how to express truth with grace. We've got to learn how to be Jesus, not just preach Jesus. Be Jesus first and continue to, to be Jesus further. Listen, you don't have to go get outside of your box of conviction. I want some of you to hear this so you feel settled down right now towards me. You don't have to get outside of your box of true conviction in order to genuinely love people despite their convictions. But secondly, to reach beyond your viewpoint. Number two, listen closely and speak carefully. Listen closely and speak carefully. The toughest people to deal with are not just people with opposing viewpoints, but people who know that, that, um, that you don't care about their viewpoint, okay? I didn't say you have to agree with their viewpoint. I'm talking about caring about what people are feeling, what they're thinking, and what they're believing. Listen, we can't expect to reach others of different viewpoints when all we do is go crazy whenever other people don't agree with our viewpoint. I want you to hear this. We have a lot of loud, barking Christ followers of Christ. We have a lot of loud, barking Christ followers. 
People who just yell loudly from their viewpoint and, and their seats and, and then wonder why non-believers don't want to sit beside them in their church seat. Our society has been bred to know what we're against, but not what we're for. If we are to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, we must change our attitude. We must change our approach. We must listen more than we preach. Probably need to pray more than we, we preach because that's the only way we're, God's going to be able to take over the reins. We must make our love louder and clearer, not just make our point loud and clear. James chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, and then verse 26. It says, understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. Verse 26 says, if you claim to be religious, but don't control your tongue, you are fooling yourself, and your religion is worthless. How many of you ever thought you were listening but you realize the only thing you were doing was doing like I do, and that is listening until it's your turn to say your viewpoint. Listen, if you have to decide between preaching the gospel versus living the gospel, choose to live it above all else. How you live, how you love will have far greater impact than what you live. The agenda should not be about winning a debate or looking right, but making sure that whatever we say or do points other people to Christ. Now, I've already learned, like I said, I, I thank God for my children because they, they, they basically prepare 75% of my messages for me. I'm like, if this is going to work with them and those hard heads, it's going to work maybe with other people. And so I thank God that God sometimes allows us, even through our family and our friends, to realize that we need to make a change. And then probably we have to do that with trying to help connect to other people. We have to make sure that whatever we say or do is pointing other people to Christ. Listen, yelling, shouting, and belittling others is never the Jesus way. Once again, ask me how I know. Ephesians 4, 29 through 32 says, Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. Get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and harsh words and slander as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. The greatest breakthroughs that I've had um, with my boys or anybody else if something was intense and words got away from you or this or that, is when, is when we're able to both come to the table and they realize, hey, you know what? He loves me above all else. While he might be passionate about his convictions, he still is mindful that maybe I don't have those convictions. Seek to listen more than you speak. Don't let your anger lead you towards spewing discouraging mouth vomit that only repels those listening. Seek to understand, not just to be understood. I can truly sit here and tell you, I felt like this was the case when I was going into last year, and this was definitely the case going into this year, is that God just really put it on my heart. Try to actively listen to people's heart, not just their words. Words can feel conflicted, but their hearts. Proverbs ten nineteen says, too much talk leads to sin. Man, I've been sinning all my life says, be simp sensible. I might have wanted me to say, say um, simple. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. I didn't say that. That's the New Living Translation. In Matthew 12, 36, Jesus says in the Amplified Version of the Bible, it says, but I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will have to give an accounting for every careless or useless word they speak. You ever think about this? I'm not accountable for what the other person does, right? I'm not accountable for what they do. I'm not accountable for what they say. I'm not even accountable for how they respond to what I say or do. I'm accountable for what I say and what I do. Because the eyes of the Lord are upon all of us. None of us, none of us can, can just um, shy away from, from his evaluation and, and, and his judgment. But thirdly today, to reach beyond your viewpoint, you need to look for common ground. You need to look for common ground. On this point, I'm really going to try to just be as personal as I can be, even in the light of this 
this ministry to, to kind of give you a window in to, to um, how my mind and heart thinks. Um, uh, 30, and, 30 years and six months and counting ago, I felt God's call to become a full-time um, minister of the gospel. Again, never thought one time during my childhood years or teenage years about being a pastor. If anything, it was something I was running from, not running to. During the summer of 1993, I, I surrendered my entire life's vocation to God, which meant no matter what I would do from that point forward, I would seek with all that I had to be a full-time minister. I've had the privilege of serving on the paid staff of eight different churches from, from South Carolina to both sides of Georgia to, um, to, to Texas. Not one of those opportunities were ever sought based on how much money I was going to get or not get. Much like when I started pastoring this church years ago, it was never a financial decision. It was, hey, this is what God's calling me to do and whatever that takes. With my college degree and with my master's degree, I could always make more money outside the church than I could inside the church. I've spent all my years of ministry seeking to meet people where they are and seeking to find common ground between us so that I can share God's love with whoever and however. I want you to listen to how the Apostle Paul did the same thing to share the gospel. Look at 1 Corinthians 9, and we're going to look at verses 14 through 22. He says, The Lord ordered that those who preach the good news should be supported by those who benefit from it. Yet I have never used any of these rights, and I am not writing this to suggest that I want to start now. In fact, I would rather die than lose my right to boast about preaching without charge. Yet preaching the good news is not something I can boast about. I am compelled by God to do it, how terrible for me if I didn't preach the good news. If I were doing this on my own initiative, I would deserve payment. But I have no choice, for God has given me this sacred trust. What then is my pay? It is the opportunity to preach the good news without charging anyone. And then he moves on in the latter part of verse 18. It says, that's why I never demand my rights when I preach the good news. Even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many people to Christ. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under that law, even though I am not subject to the law. I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness, and I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. Listen, to reach people of different viewpoints, we must not dwell on the barriers and the differences, but find the common ground. Hey, I'm a sinner. You're a sinner? Hey, I got problems. You got problems. Hey, I need Jesus. You need Jesus. Do you notice it's not you, but we, us. Listen, as a pastor, I never approach people saying, you have to do things my way or I won't love you or you're not welcome. You have to give certain amounts of money. You have to wear certain clothes. You have to say certain words. You have to believe certain things that I believe. I just seek to love them, and this church seeks to love them just the way they are. Now listen, you can love somebody just where they are, but care too much to leave them there. So it's not about belittling the truth, but I want you to hear this. This church's vision is centered around finding common ground so that we can even remove the the unnecessary barriers that keep us from the opportunity to share the gospel. You know why it's so, in my opinion, it is easier to reach people than ever before? Because ain't nobody reaching nobody. 75% of society is unchurched. Christians are sitting back at their churches, getting fat and sassy. Maybe the preacher just got fat and sassy with them just now. But I say this passionately, you know. We do things just like everybody else. We'll get the same results everybody else gets. I remember one time he, a, a, a guy that was at 
one of my, at my former church, he came to me and he, and he, and he brought me, he, he had been in another church sometime, and he, and he brought me his um, bulletin from his other church. He said, why don't our bulletin look like their bulletin? I said, well, you want this church to look like the church you left? I said, if you like it so much the way they do it, then, you know, you can do that. But we're not trying to just have a club. We're trying to reach people for Christ. And you can't do that without stepping outside of the box and removing the barriers. And so if you want to understand our methodology here at this church, the reason why you barely ever even hear that we got donation places, the reason why the pastor even dresses down this much, because actually sometimes I feel more comfortable as far as the pastor position to dress Beyond this, I dress this way purposely so that other people understand, listen, whether you're wearing jeans or shorts, as long as you're wearing something, <laughs> got to stay up for some of you. Made a mistake one time. This is a lie when I say this. God got all over me. I was like, I can't lie about that. I was going to say, I made a mistake one time, and I told a guy, I said, listen, you can wear whatever you wear to bed. And I'll just leave that at that. So he wore shoes. That's a mental picture none of you will be able to get out. God just knows when to kind of soften the mode so we don't get all serious on each other and y'all don't throw stuff at me and I don't throw stuff at you. But how many of you, how many of you really, 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 really would like your family and friends and, and, and the world to know Christ? Well, let's not get in the way of Christ. Let's not fight over things that aren't worth the fight. Let's, let's, let's fight for the very thing that Jesus gave his life for, and that is lost souls. Let's, let's fight to make a difference, not just to, um, you know, be different. Listen, we don't change the gospel, but we have to do whatever it takes to share the gospel. So, so you have to remove the barriers, you have to, you have to um, bring things to the point where you've got common ground. And, and um, listen, I don't ever hope that people have marital troubles, but sometimes it takes people marital struggles for me to get to sit down at the table with them over stuff. Or, or people go through a crisis of, of any other sort. And, and, and it's in that time that I'm able to help them understand that I can relate to their struggles. It's just if, if I dodge whatever bullet they're dealing with, it was just by the grace of God. Listen, we let people know around here that we're real people with real problems. But there's also a real Savior. And he's the one that makes the real difference in us. Do you hear what I'm saying? When someone can understand it is Christ in us, it is not us that saved us. It is not us that makes us different than the world. It is Christ's love and light in us. That's what separates us from the crowd. But fourthly, to reach beyond your viewpoint... Don't act self-righteous. Don't act self-righteous. This one comes quite natural to me as well. So you can, you can be doing something and you don't realize it. Now, I don't want any of your wives elbowing your husband. But, um, but, but honestly, my, my wife probably has been my greatest teacher. She's, she's, the, she's the one that keeps me humble. She's the one that keeps me honest. She's the one that sometimes helps me to see things through a different viewpoint. Most people don't realize my wife didn't go to church all of her life growing up. She might have gone here or there for just periodically, but, but they, they didn't go. Um, two weeks after I started seeing her, um, I got to lead her to Christ. And she just started growing as fast as she could. And, 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 and so here, here's why I say that. My wife has a tremendous... Um, viewpoint that helps me she knows what it's like to think about the people who did, didn't go to church Sunday morning Sunday night Wednesday night she knows how to be that person who doesn't know exactly where you're supposed to sit but you know if you do sit down there sister Susie's going to be taking you out because she left her scarf right there trying to let you know that seat was marked she knows what it's like to feel on the outside looking in and not quite know how to look like a Christian. Listen, I can't think of anything that turns people off more than those who, who, who think and act like they are self-righteous, like those who think they are better than everybody else. Do you know who Jesus had the most issues with? 
It was not unchurched lost people. It was religious fools. It was people who were full of themselves, who thought that they were self-righteous and they were better than other people. And in every case, Jesus set them straight. In fact, the people Jesus rebuked the most, as I just said, were religious, self-righteous people. Look at Matthew 9, 10 through 17. It says, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he said, Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Then he added, Now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. Listen, there is no such thing as a self-righteous person. The only righteousness that we have, even as, as believers in Christ, is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ that paid the price for our sins and covered us in his righteousness. Galatians 6, 3 says, If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. I think, I think those last few few um, words. I think my wife wrote those. <laughs> Listen, don't just aim to look like you're right and everybody else is wrong. Don't act like you're, you're self-righteous. Acting like you're, you're better than anyone is an instant turn off. Once again, something that my kids have taught me. My, see, my kids, I'm not their pastor. I'm their dad. Okay? I'm their dad, not their pastor. Um, all of us have to have struggles with that type of stuff of what I'm talking about is that, that, that we just have to be, um, who we need to be. And, 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 and if they don't feel like we're approachable, which I have been, been that way before, not because I don't invite ones to come to me, but based off of maybe how they felt, I expressed myself the last time where they felt like, well, Daddy's not really wanting to hear my viewpoint. I already know Daddy doesn't agree with my viewpoint, but Daddy doesn't even seem like he wants to hear my viewpoint. And God's convicted me about that. And I often say, you know, my, my kids didn't change first. I did. I did. I just regrouped. I was like, okay. Because you know why? I, it's not about being right. I care way too much about my kids to not do everything within my power to be Jesus to them. I own my stuff. I ask forgiveness. And I try my best to go, okay, how can I? Listen, because if, if I can't share it with those who are dearest to me, should I even be sharing it with others? Listen, acting like you're better than anybody else is an instant turn off. It will shut things down quickly, especially, listen, if the person doesn't know you and is way on the other side of your viewpoint. Luke 8, 7 says, Let any one of you who is without sin, though, be the first to throw a stone at her. Listen, don't throw stones at others and don't just point fingers at others. You know what they say when you got one finger pointing forward, there's, 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 there's four pointing back. We've all been there. We've all done that. We, we have to make sure that we intentionally do not prejudge people. Listen, the best people that I run into are the people who they know that they're not righteous. That makes sense to you? I can, I can sit down with some, somebody else who feels broken like me, someone else who feels as far from perfect as me. Those people, we can have great conversations because there's mutual brokenness. There's, a, there's not a perspective of, hey, you know what? I'm up here and you're up down there. We're just both reaching down at the altar holding hands. Last but not least, number five, to reach beyond your viewpoint, you need to pray for kingdom impact. You need to pray for kingdom impact. Listen, every believer in Christ is called to reach other people for Christ. I want you to put something down in your notes. Just this, these words, find three people. Find three people. Find three people who you know, whether you work with them, go to school with them, they're, they're close to you, whether they're friend or family, that you know does not know Christ, 
or maybe they just aren't close to Christ at this time, and say, hey, God, use me to make impact in them. Take those three names, start praying for them. Pray, pray that they're going to come to one of our several Easter services this year. Let's just say you said that. You just start praying now. But you also start saying, God, how can you speak through me? How can you touch through me? Listen, every believer has been called to reach other people for Christ. We can't do this effectively with people just inside the church. But we have to build intentional relationships, listen to me, with people outside the church. One of the goals that God's put on my heart, the more and more that I'm able to release things um, to, to other trustworthy men and women in this church, and I'm so thankful for all of you that make, make it where I can get freer and freer in the community and try to reach out to people, is, is this. I want to I reach every business person we have in, this, in Waterboro, period. Every one of them. I want to have as I want to have a personal um, connection with them. I want to I want to invite them. I want to love on them. I want to pray for them, and I want them to know what I always feel, and that's this: they don't have to walk in this church for me to love them. They don't have to walk into this church for me to care about them and pray for them. We want to send that message loud and clear. Listen: a willingness to do anything possible to share the gospel must be in you before it becomes reality through you. Matthew 9, 35 through 38, it says, Jesus, he traveled throughout all the towns and villages of that area, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is, is great. Or in other translation, it says the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. Do you know what I pray on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, more than I ever prayed before? Let me have, God, one more person who will actually sell out to you. Let me have one person who I don't have to babysit who says, you know what? I don't want to just be watching from the bleachers. I want to be engaged in the mission. I want to let, let Christ speak through me. Listen, that starts with compassion. Again, you can't reach people who aren't where you are if you don't go where they are, if you don't meet them where they are, if you don't have compassion for them. Listen, I've had it in, in every Bible I've ever owned. I've had the words, God, help me never get used to men, women, boys, and girls dying and going to hell. That is still a catalyst for my life. That is still something that I go, hey, you know what? That's, that's what God has told me to do. Again, we're not trying to just have another church. We're trying to figure out how we can be the church. And the church needs to get the memo that not everybody thinks like we think. Not everybody's just been in a church. Not everybody's comfortable in a church. Like a 55-year-old man that I buried just a couple weeks ago right here at this church. He was a truck driver before. He'd never been to church before. And, and, and uh, we were meeting in the gym at that time, and, and, and he, he, said, he said God tricked him because they said, we're just going to a gym, Daddy. We're just going to a gym. And, 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 he, and he got there, and he got around people who were loving, and lifting, and leading him to Jesus. And three months later, we baptized him. And, and, he, and he, he took his Bible to work the rest of his life. He was more radical. By the way, I see people who just come to know Christ that are more radical than the people who claim to have known him all their life. And that doesn't make sense to people, you see? That doesn't make sense to people. People are trying to figure out, hey, if it's that big a deal, why are we not having these conversations? Why are you not going to the extreme? Listen, can you tell me anything more important than a soul being saved? Can you tell me anything? Can you tell me anything next to that, anything more important than somebody finding the love of God and learning how to walk in that love? Listen, Jesus' entire earthly life revolved around living and sharing the gospel. He had a huge compassion for those who were confused and lost like sheep without a shepherd. Before I got here to share this message, I promise you, 
I prayed extremely hard. I, I mean, even this morning, I was like, man, God, these people coming in here with all sorts of problems and issues and everything else, they could be so upset whenever the pastor's just preaching about reaching beyond your viewpoint. And you know why? Because we want everything to be about us when it's not all about us. Listen, the best joy I have in my life is not living about me. The greatest joy that I have is knowing that, hey, God could use me this week just to reach one more person. And so in order for us to not be a self-centered church, we have to continue to be concerned not just about those who are with us, but those who aren't with us and won't be with us when they die. 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 2 says, Finally, dear brothers and sisters, we ask you to pray for us. Pray that the Lord's message will reach and spread rapidly and be honored wherever it goes, just as when it came to you. Pray, too, that we will be rescued from wicked and evil people, for not everyone is a believer. Listen, to reach beyond our viewpoint, we must love like Jesus. We must listen and care about other people. We must look for common ground. We must not act self-righteous. And we must pray for kingdom impact. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Heavenly Father, God, right now, I just pray, God, that you would move upon this place, that you would move upon each heart. Lord, I pray if there's anyone listening to me right now that, that has not yet trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior and made them their Lord, I pray today would be today that they confess their sin. Lord, they ask your forgiveness of their sin, and they believe God, and your son Jesus, who died on the cross for their sins and who overcame the grave for their eternal life. God, I pray that they would invite Jesus into their heart today and decide from this day forward to follow you. God, I pray for others who, who've known you for a while, just as myself. I pray, Lord, you might place a fire within us and a compassion within us and an earnest genuineness within us to be Jesus to a lost and confused world. Lord, bless our conversations, guide our conversations, and use our opportunities. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand with us today? This altar is open. I'm available should you want to come and pray with me.